Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. We continue in our study of the book of Romans. Last week we concluded chapter 1 in which the Apostle Paul wrote his greetings and introduction to the letter. Paul was very forceful in the opening chapter articulating the message of the gospel and how the world rejects the message of the gospel. Remember we saw last week that the Apostle Paul was talking about suppressing the truth that we see in creation and we see innately in ourselves that that sense of morality that we have. It's fascinating to me that one of the biggest arguments for the existence of God the world tries hardest to reject, and that is morality. There is this understanding in the world that morality is whatever the common consensus is among the people. Except every society in history, whether they've been connected to others or not, has had basically the same sets of rules. It's not right to take your, your neighbor's wife. It's not right to take your neighbor's cow, not the same thing. I had to clarify that for Chuck because he likes that joke. It's, it's, it's not okay to kill somebody for, without reason. Those are, those are sensibilities that we all have innately. Where did that come from? If we are animals, we would have no sensibility like that. And so that's one of the arguments that the world makes that the Apostle Paul shot down. Those are things that prove the existence of God. Chapter 1 is all about, uh, the second half of chapter 1 is all about the world rejecting that, suppressing the truth. Romans 1.18. We begin this morning in chapter 2, and the title of my message this morning is No Partiality. We're going to cover Romans 2, 1 through 11. No Partiality. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. Now let me just say at the outset, I told the guys this morning, I've really been struggling writing this series on Romans. I don't know why. I, I've, I've preached Romans before, but Satan has really been going after me on this, uh, on this study. I've really been struggling with it. Last week I wrote the, the message three times. I redid this one three times as well. Um, I don't know why, but uh, it tells me that Satan doesn't want us to hear this. And that's how important it is. As we start our, start our verse by verse study of this uh, pericope, this passage, uh, I should tell you that New Testament scholars are in sharp division concerning who the Apostle Paul is addressing here. I was amazed at the diversity of, of opinions by New Testament scholars. Who is Paul addressing? Some significant scholars say that in this entire section, 1 through 17, Paul's addressing Jews. Except he doesn't mention them directly until you get to verse 17. And so I, I kind of think maybe that's not who he's addressing. <clears throat> I'll explain further as we go along, but I think he's talking about moral people. People with some sense of morality. And I think we'll develop this as, as we move on. Paul begins with, therefore. And what's the rule when we, when we start a, a verse with, therefore? You've got to find out what it's there for. What does it do? What's this word doing? It's linking us to what we saw. What we saw in chapter 1. Remember, no verse in chapter division. So what Paul had just previously said as he was talking about the suppression of truth, because of that suppression of truth, we have no excuse. Every one of you who judges is passing judgment on another. You condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice 
the very same thing. Paul clearly addresses in the previous section the unregenerate who suppresses the truth rather than living by it. He then moves on in chapter 2, verse 1 to say that mankind has no excuse. There, there is the, the revelation of God in creation and in the sense of morality that everybody sees. No matter where they are, they see those things. They may suppress it, but they still see them. And so there is no excuse. The Greek translation of no excuse in this passage literally means that we have no legal defense. We don't have a way to defend ourselves for, for what we do as sinful man. What, what's he talking about? When we judge others. We don't have an excuse for that. We can't offer a defense to God for our sins as we condemn others for those same sins. He then moves on into what seems to be one of the most common traits of sinful man. And that's the willingness to judge others while overlooking the same offense in ourselves. You can almost guarantee that when somebody's hypercritical about somebody else, that what they're hypercritical about is something they do themselves. You can almost guarantee that. I know, I know there are times I'm guilty of that. And I suspect most of us, if not all of us, are guilty of that from time to time. But look what Paul says. When we pass judgment on someone, we're also judging ourselves because we're also guilty of that. So if we declare that everybody that does this is guilty, we need to recognize that makes us also guilty. We often fail to recognize it, but it's still the truth. We know that judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Yes, it's right for God to judge them. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourselves, that you will escape the judgment of God? I love these rhetorical questions <coughs> that Paul asks. Here's your first question of the morning. I was light on you last week. I'm going to make up for that this morning. When we pass judgment on someone for doing the very thing we do, what have we become? Hypocrite. Thank you. One word, hypocrite. That's exactly right. We've become hypocrites. Saying one thing and doing something else, or condemning someone for what we also do. We become hypocrites. We condemn someone for doing the very thing we do. We have become first class hypocrites. Think about this passage for a moment without the chapter and verse divisions. Paul spends quite a bit of time talking about those who suppress the reality of the truth of God and the reality of, of God's word. And then the very next thing that he says is that as a group we ought to know better. Now who's the group he's talking to? We, we started to talk about this a little bit at the beginning of chapter, uh, uh, verse 1. Who's he talking to? I think he's talking to moral people. Or, may I say, self-righteous people who feel like they're good enough because of the way they live. I, we, know, we all know them. We all, we all have run into them. They, they think they're good enough that their good deeds have outweighed their bad deeds, and so when they get to the cosmic scale at the pearly gates... Peter will go, well, let me get a reading here. Okay, you're good. That doesn't work that way. But that's the prevailing thought. If people think there is something past this life, if they don't know Jesus, the prevailing thought is, I got to do worse. I got to do, I got to be faster than the slowest guy. I got to be better than the worst guy. It's kind of the idea. It's difficult in this passage to say whether Paul is referring just to Jews or if he's talking to all religious peoples. Certainly, as, as we saw in our Sunday school lesson, the Jews had an advantage because they had been given the law directly from God. And the law told them how to live. They knew what they were doing wrong. But as Greg Kokel said in, in Sunday school, that's true for Gentiles too. 
That law that is written on our heart that we call our sense of morality is still true. We know when we violate it. You know when you go 80 on I-75, you're doing something wrong. Well, how do I know you know that? Because when you see a cop, you slam on the brakes. You know you're doing it wrong. We have a sense of sensibility and morality. And so I think that's who Paul's talking to. He's talking to those people that are condemning the others while they do the very same thing. Paul then continues that it's right and expected that God would judge people who judge others while being guilty of the same thing themselves. He then asks a rhetorical question, knowing that God rightly judges those things. Do you really think you can get away with it? What makes us think we can get away with it? What makes us think that we can do something against God's law and he won't say something? In our, in our daily Bible reading this morning, we, we read about the, uh, in, in Ezekiel, we read about the, the secret meetings of their leadership that since God was no longer in the temple, he wouldn't know that they were violent. How, how, how dumb do we think we, God is? I mean, let's face it. When I was a kid and I'd scoop, Harper is not alone in this, liking butter. I would scoop butter and put it behind my, my back and run away from my mom. I couldn't see it, so she couldn't either. Makes perfect sense when you're two years old. Why do we still think that works with God today? I can go in the quiet of my room and nobody will know. Yeah, God knows. Do we really think that we can get away with doing the same thing? Paul continues on. Or do you presume on the riches and of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? I have to tell you, this is a complex verse. Paul asks a question, and that reminds me of how the Jews acted in Jerusalem and Judea right before the exile. We, we've been talking about this as we go through this, our readings. Israel always thought that God ultimately would not punish them because they were his chosen. Then in 722, Assyria takes the northern tribes captive. And so the Judeans thought, well, we're really the chosen because we have the temple and we have, we have de king, uh, a descendant of King David on the throne, God's chosen. And so we're really the chosen. And then 605, Nebuchadnezzar sacks Judah and starts to lay siege on Jerusalem. And so the people that are all holed up inside Jerusalem say, well, we're really the chosen because we have the priests and we have the temple and we're in God's holy place, Jerusalem, until Jerusalem falls. And so there's this idea that God's not actually going to do what he said he's going to do because he called us. The church, by and large, has that misconception as well. We're his chosen. God has called us to be his, his children. And so he's not actually going to do that until he does. And then everybody gets upset with God. That's the question Paul's asking here. For what reason do you think God will not actually punish you of something that you did or something that you are? Why do we think God won't punish us? How many people do you know that think they can get away with it? That, that maybe know the gospel, have heard the gospel, and think, yeah, I'll take my chances. Take their chances right to hell. They think that because they did this or that, or they gave money to the church, or they lived in America, or even said a prayer, signed a card, walked an aisle, that God won't punish them for their continuing sins. Now let me be extremely, extremely clear here. Listen to my words. If you have truly trusted God to forgive you, your sins are forgiven, that can never be undone. Hear me. If you truly have confessed your sins to God and trusted Him, your sins are forgiven. If you just said a prayer, you re somebody told you, repeat after me. Dear Jesus, come into my heart. If that's all you did, 
I question whether or not you're saved. But understand, if you truly trust in Him, you are redeemed. It can't be under, undone. You won't have to pay for your sins. But, what you do as a believer, still you are accountable for. We'll talk about that some more. Look again at verse 4. Or do you presume on the riches of His kindness and forbearance of His patience? Are you depending on what God has, who God is? God will not allow us to presume on His kindness and patience forever. If we've truly trusted Him and we're truly saved, God will not allow us to go unpunished forever if we continue to walk in sin. He's not going to let you do it. At some time, God will punish even His chosen, the Jews of Israel or the church. God will correct you through various means, through illness, through chastisement from others, through what goes on in your world, through a car accident. Who knows how He's going to do it, but He will do it. Failure to respond to His correction will result in what? Death. Not a loss of salvation, but a loss of physical human life. God will say, that's it, I'm done. You're out. Please understand me here. God will not and God cannot unsave you. If He wrote your name in the Lamb's book of life before creation, there your name will remain. But if you continue to sin after He saved you, He may take you out. God provides us kindness not to allow us to do whatever we want. Remember, that was a question that Paul had to answer, right? Because of God's grace, should I sin more? Of course not. God provides us kindness not to allow us to do more of what we want, but to direct us back to Him. Direct us back to repentance. As we've been going through our Bible reading each year, we see how long God tolerated the Jews... Sinful life, their idolatrous life, their adulterous life. Until finally he said, that's it, I'm done. Began in 722, ended in 586, I think still going on. The word kindness in the Greek word is charis to te os, charis to te tos which means more than kindness. It's, it's used in the New Testament principally by Paul to speak of God's attitude to sinners through Jesus Christ. It's the character of God to forgive us through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Paul uses the same word here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Why does God share with you the immeasurable riches? Why is He kind to us? So that He can draw us, steer us, correct us. God has forgiven all of our sins, yet many Christians stand in judgment of others. Why? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourselves in the days of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. I think clearly in verse 5, Paul is not talking about Christians. I think he's not addressing believers here. People with hard and impenitent, unrepentant hearts are not believers, not followers of Jesus. Most New Testament scholars believe that Paul addresses those people with a sense of morality and judge those around them, perhaps even Jews. Maybe Paul here is addressing the Jews in Rome that have this, well, we're superior than you because we have one God, the true God, Jehovah, and we have his laws and we keep his laws. At least they say they do. They don't actually. We know that, right? The Jews 
had ways of getting around the laws that, that God had given them. The sense here is that those unrepentant moral people have been complaining that God was not judging the really wicked people of the world. Those with, with a sense of morality who actually live in a moral way are complaining that God isn't judging those who don't live in a moral way. All the while, not being truly righteous. In, in Romans 1.18, Paul said that God's wrath, present tense, same word here, is being stored up against the moralizers. It will become evident on the day of God's wrath. Paul mentions God's wrath in verse 124 and 126 and 128, and now here again in 2.5. As we look at the progression of those mentions of wrath, we see that Paul is talking about the increasingly sinful practices that will be judged. There is coming a judgment. Final judgment is coming. He will render to each one according to his works. To those who... Pra who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who do, who, who do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. To those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. I don't know what happened. My verses there didn't, uh, didn't line up right. In verse 5, Paul introduces the day of wrath, the final judgment by God, which he will render to each one according to his works. Now, these verses are really easy to misunderstand. This is what makes this part of uh, Romans so difficult. Let me say as clearly and plainly as I can. Please hear me. In this, salvation has always been and will always be by faith alone, through God's grace alone. It is never by anything that you do. You bring nothing to salvation except your sinful, filthy self. And God helps you with that. He gives you the faith to believe. It's never been based on works. It's not based on works here. That's not what Paul is saying in this text. This passage, I believe, is not specifically about salvation. It's about judgment. We have to separate the two. When were your sins as followers of Jesus dealt with? On the cross. There can be no judgment of those sins for salvation. Again, they've been dealt with. They're gone. They're disposed of. As God says, He can remember them no more. It's not that He can't. It's that he won't remember them anymore. The Old and New Testaments have several references concerning judgment based on works. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says that a man sows, he shall reap. In Galatians 6, Paul says he shall reap if, if you do not grow weary in due time. Isaiah and Jeremiah both talk about the punishment of the people's deeds. So let me see if I can make this a little bit more clear concerning salvation, where we'll spend eternity. We've all been judged guilty and sentenced to death because we've all sinned. We started out that way. We've started out as sinners, guilty, condemned to die. We're on death row in the moment we're conceived. But before all of that, God chose some of us. Why? I don't know. That's a question I'm not capable of answering. And quite frankly, neither are you. Nobody is. Only God. God chose some that he would save. He then orchestrated, and to use Greg Kokel's word, words, he orchestrated a rescue plan for us to come to him. He then gave you the faith to believe, and you believed. So you will not be judged for your sins regarding salvation ever again. That's been dealt with. That was cared for by Jesus' sacrifice. Now, as we look at verses 6 through 8, we need to see 
a division of groups. Look again at verse 7. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. Those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. Question two, who seeks glory, honor, and immortality? I'm sorry? Those he has called. Okay, very good. The follower of Jesus, right? Those he has called become followers of Jesus. We seek for his glory, his honor, and we seek immortality. Clearly, when we view this verse in the context of the rest of Scripture, these are traits of the true followers of Jesus who seek to glorify God in their actions. The unregenerate man never seeks to glorify God. Never seeks to follow God's truth. Those who seek to glorify God have to be His followers to whom God has already granted eternal life. In contrast, those who seek to glorify and honor God in contrast to them, are those who seek to glorify themselves. Look again at verse 8. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be God's wrath and fury if those who do not obey the truth, or for those who do not obey the truth, because they're all about themselves. If they continue to follow that path of unrighteousness, what happens? Eternal damnation. I get the sense from this passage that since verse 7 clearly refers to redeemed people and their judgment, that it won't be for salvation. There's no judgment that can happen again for you for salvation because that's dealt with by the cross. The same is true for the people in verse 8. This judgment will not be for salvation or for the lack of salvation, but for the punishment they will receive. How severe a punishment. To be more precise, where they, how they will spend eternity. On both sides of the equation, I think there are levels of, of position in heaven and levels of position in hell. You will get your rewards to lay at Jesus' feet or you'll be closer to the fire. You know, we, we have this saying that there's a special place in hell for people that do such a... I think that might be a legitimate thing. And I think that's what Paul is saying here. There's judgment coming even for the believer. For what? For salvation? No, that's already been dealt with. For how you spend eternity. How many rewards you have. Will you always be saved? Yes. Can you ever be unsaved? No. But there will be levels of reward that you have. Revelations ta Revelation talks about, about the, the white robe we have, which is our righteousness, our righteous deeds. How many people are going to spend eternity in a bikini? Oh, please, Lord, not me. That's what you should be saying right now about me. Followers of Jesus will be judged to determine the rewards or loss of rewards. Not our eternal status, that's been dealt with. I think the same is true for the unregenerate people of verse 8. Their eternal status was determined before, before creation. In, in theological speak, that's double predestination. God called some to be saved. What's that mean? He didn't call the others. I, I have read so many people on this, and it's amazing to me that there are people that actually argue that God called some to be saved and had no effect on them that, didn't, that weren't called. How, how does that work? I, I can't do math very well, but I can figure that formula out. That's, in theological speak, we call that double predestination. He predestined them to be saved, and he predestined them not to be saved. Why? I don't know. I wish I did. I'd be the greatest theologian in history if I could figure that out. Here's the reality of it. God didn't tell us who he chose and who he didn't chose. And what did he do? He said, I'm not going to tell you that secret. 
I want you to go evangelize everybody. Let me worry about the, how they respond. You just worry about telling them. See, the Apostle Paul's in, in this section of, of Romans where he's preparing the Romans for doing just that being the base of operations to tell the Western Mediterranean and Europe about Jesus. So this is an important topic for him to, to cover with them. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does, not, who does evil. The Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. The Jew first and also the Greek. As I was studying this, this was a this was a uh, this, this this these two verses were were a mystery to me in one respect. The, the part about to the Jew first and also to the Greek just kind of convoluted this whole topic for me in this discussion a little bit. And I think that's why I was I was struggling with it. Those who continue in a lifestyle style of evil will face tribulation and distress. Whether they're Jewish or whether they're Gentile. You can replace Greek there with Gentile. It is, it is the word that, I mean, it's transliterated Greek. But it doesn't mean just people of Greek-speaking origin. It, it is used as a colloquial term in, in Koine Greek to speak of Gentiles. In Scripture, almost always when they talk about Greek, the Greek as opposed to the Jew, they're talking about a Gentile. I know that doesn't help Brian and his Jew-Gentile problems going on in his head, but hopefully it will help. I know, it's, it's making it more difficult for you, I get it. Whether they're Jews or Gentiles, it doesn't make a difference. Salvation and regeneration by God result in, in no longer seeking evil, no longer seeking self-interest. The person who continues in evil will be judged by God and experience Affliction and distress. The word distress is the Greek word stenochoria. It talks about distress, but it has as, it, as its root of being in a confined space. It, it is kind of like being claustrophobic and not able to get out. The stress, the anguish of that. Claustrophobia is one of the strongest visceral emotional responses somebody that truly has claustrophobia if they're locked in a small space it is really 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 difficult and that's the idea of this word it's the pressure of god's judgment both in this life and the next the next phrase by paul is completely in keeping with the way paul organized his mission activity paul always attempted to reach out to the jew first when they rejected or had been led to Christ, then he went on to the Gentiles. Paul did this because the truth was first given to the Jews. Who were the first people in the world to receive God's written word? The Jews. If Dr. Luke was a Gentile, he's the only Gentile author of Scripture. They were primarily Jewish writers who wrote Scripture. So Paul reaches out to the Jews first because they were the first ones to have the truth of his word. They had the Old Testament prophets. They had Moses. They, had, they already had some revelation from God, more than just general revelation. They had specific revelation of his word. But they rejected it. They rejected the prophets by and large. They rejected John the baptizer. By and large, they rejected Jesus. All part of God's plan, by the way. Then in verse 10, Paul moves on to those who do good. Those who do good refers to the redeemed, the followers of God. Again, this is not a works salvation reference. As followers of Jesus, we do good by following Jesus because of being saved. We do good because we have been saved, not to get saved. Doing good did not ever get us get anyone saved. It's the result of being saved. Jesus made the same argument in John chapter 5, verse 29. And came out those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection 
of judgment. That's what's coming. Jesus said, look, there is coming a time we'll all get resurrected. Those regenerate will be resurrected to eternity with me. Those who, who have rejected me will be resurrected to an eternity of judgment. Before Jesus, or both Jesus and Paul divide the people of the world into two distinct categories, saved and unsaved. Those who follow God and those who do not. Those who continue to practice evil and those who do not. I would argue that God made that distinction before creation. What I cannot answer for you is the why. There's a great big why question there. Why did God do it that way? I can't answer that. I can't answer the question of why God chose me and didn't choose somebody else. But don't heap on yourselves the, the, the guilt of the fact that God chose you meant he didn't choose somebody else. It's not a zero-sum game. Just because he chose you didn't mean he didn't choose somebody else just because he chose you. So take that guilt from you. There's a lot of Christians that feel that. It's misplaced. I, I think, quite honestly, it puts more worth on yourself than you are more value on yourself than you are. As a result of God calling me to be His, He put into action His rescue plan, which included Jesus on the cross. It included Jesus in the grave. It included Jesus coming out of the grave. It included the Apostle Paul teaching. It included people coming to know Him until somebody led the people that led me to the Lord, led them to the Lord. They led me to the Lord, and then hopefully... I lead others to the Lord. That's the plan that God has put together. It included bringing me to the point that I would believe and then giving me the faith to believe. God's rescue plan includes everything. I bring my sin. He brought everything else. It's a pretty good deal. The work of the Holy Spirit in my life changed how I thought and acted. Now let me be very clear. It wasn't immediate. God has been working on my heart now through 53 years of salvation. I'm 64. Saved at 11. He's been working on my heart. I think he was working on my heart before. When I'd go to confession, Father, forgive me for I've sinned. A lot of times, it's been one day since my last confession and I've done this and this. And this. Okay, just cut to the chase. He was, he's working, been working on my heart since, since before I can remember. But I, he saved me at the right, most opportune time. He gave me faith to believe. Paul concludes this section, for God shows no partiality. Concludes with a brief sentence. He opens the book with that great big long sentence. And here's a short little sentence. God shows no partiality. You know, I read this and then I go, well, wait a minute, Paul. Clearly he does. Clearly God shows partiality. Because those he chose are going to spend eternity with him and those that he didn't choose are not going to spend eternity with him. They're going to spend eternity in anguish. So how does Paul then use this, this understanding? Which is my final question for you today. In what way does God not show partiality? How can God, how can Paul, at the direction of the Holy Spirit, write that God shows no partiality when he just spent a whole bunch of verses saying there's two different people, groups, saved and unsaved? Because of free will? That's an interesting answer. Okay, we're not puppets. The rain falls on the just and the unjust, okay. Well, he was just speaking about Jews and Gentiles, so he's given both an opportunity to comprehend there's no partiality there. Okay, you're, you're on the right track. Dig, dig deeper into that thought. God doesn't care who I am. It's not about me. God saved me, but it's not about me. 
He didn't save me because I'm so good looking. Clearly. He didn't save me because I'm so smart. Clearly. He didn't save me for any of those reasons. I don't know what his reason is for saving me, but he did. And he saved other people, and he didn't save other people. God doesn't show partiality because of who you are. There is some other reason why God chose. The word partiality is the Greek word prosopolempsia, which literally means accept a face. He didn't accept me because of me. He accepted me because of him. There's, no, there's nothing that any human being ever did to be saved. And in that, in that respect, God shows no partiality. There is nothing about huma, humanity for God to choose some and not to choose others. There's nothing in us of redeeming value. Understand what that means. When we read this, God shows no partialities, we think that's a good thing. But really, it's a, it, really what it's saying is there is no redeeming value in man. There is no reason in man for him to choose us. It all is about him. It's about what he wants, how he thinks. We will continue our study in a couple of weeks, Lord willing, and we'll see that Paul continues down the same path to explain it further. But for today, we need to remember a few things from these 11 verses. First of all, remember why Paul's writing to the Romans. It was so that they could be prepared with the proper theological understanding of the mission God was giving to Paul, to the Romans, and to us. The mission of preaching the gospel message. For Paul... He had, done, he, he had been all through Eastern Mediterranean and, and Eastern Europe. Now he wanted to move on to the Western Mediterranean and, and Europe. For God has given each of us a mission field. Your neighbors, your workplace, your school, your social clubs, your grocery store, your family. Any place and anybody you come into contact with. That's the mission field God has placed you on. Paul was setting the record straight here. He begins by addressing a group of people that appear to be moral but aren't followers of God. Whether they're Jews or Gentiles, we don't know. But in either case, they were self-righteous. We've all seen self-righteous people. They condemn people for doing exactly the same thing as they do. They thought they were just... they were. They were, they were good enough. They were so good that they could condemn others, but God wasn't going to actually punish them. Paul then changed his tune a little and talked about the believer who acted the way they wanted to think God would never punish them, but he will. Again, not for salvation. That was dealt with by the cross. But God will punish you as a believer when you don't remain a true follower of him or when you go into a sinful pattern. Paul argued that God didn't choose those that became believers because of anything they did, will do, or anything that they are. He didn't look at their face and choose them. Well, that rich, he's a cute guy, so I'm going to choose him. That's not what God did. In spite of who I am, God chose me. Glory awaits those who follow Jesus, and anguish and distress await those who do not. Through this entire section, Paul builds up his argument for the future mission of the Romans, preaching the gospel. Let's take a hint from Paul and recognize that there are unsaved in the world all around us. I don't know who they are. I don't know who God has chosen. So i got to talk to everybody. Thank you, Father, for the reality of who you are for the truth of your word, for the truth of your message. Thank you for calling us to be your children. Thanking us for seeing 
what you want from us in the pages of your word. Our desire is to always be obedient to you and to reach out and and follow you and, and talk to people around us and cause them to see who you are as well. Father, thank you for not choosing me for something that I did or will do and for reje- or and not rejecting me for something that I did but for choosing me because of something of who you are because of your love, your grace, your mercy. Thank you for loving us. We love you in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.